Hi, everyone. So I'm moderating uh, this session, and I want to make it clear that uh, I trust the first speaker or won't mind my saying this, that uh, Although Dimitri very generously uh, says that uh, Earl and I and Dimitri were uh, organized this together, the fact is that Dimitri did about 98% of, um, of the work, the heavy lifting. And uh, yeah, if, thanks, that Ron, first, uh, if that first session was any uh, indication, this is going to be a really great workshop, one of the best I've attended in many years. It's my very great pleasure uh, now to introduce the uh, first uh, speaker in the afternoon session, Earl Miller. Take it away, Earl. Hi, everybody. Oops. I'm going to turn down my volume. We're getting a lot of echo. Yeah, I know. There. Okay. 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 Everybody can hear me okay? Uh, there's lots of feedback. Is it possible to use uh, headphones maybe or? Uh, let me try. Let me try, 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 try. Is that better? Yep, perfect. Awesome. Yeah, much better. Okay, good afternoon everyone. Unfortunately, now I'm getting the echo in my headphones. I can't speak like this. I'm getting the echo back in my headphones with, wow. with a half second delay, which means I can't. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, hang on it's a second. Hot. I'm going to try to do this and turn down my speaker so I won't be able to hear you guys very well, but hopefully you can hear me. Okay? okay. We good? Uh, there got some echo, what I, think. Uh, I think we can live with it maybe, but there's still the yeah, echo. Whoa, now there's something. Yeah, there wasn't any in the green room. I know. This is this is the kind of glitch that you, keeps you awake at night. Uh, the other thing we can do is we can invite you again on screen. I think that might sort out the problem. Let me do it one second. I'll invite you again. How about now? That might be better. Yeah, it's better now, I think. Okay, good. How many PhDs does it take to solve a uh, echo? <laughs> <laughs> so again, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce Sir Earl Miller as our first speaker. Thank you very much, Randy, and thank you for Dimitris for do really doing all the all the hard work. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I hope everyone is um, safe and well. Uh, my name is Earl Miller. Uh, I'll be talking about working memory today. Thank you all for uh, attending our, our workshop. Um, in case you don't know me, what my lab studies is the neural dynamics of cognition by using multiple electrode recording in non-human primates performing cognitive demanding tasks. We use a ray, rays of electrodes within a brain area, within a structure to look at local circuitry, and then multiple electrode arrays to look at large scale networks or macro circuitry. And today I'll be talking about spiking activity from individual neurons, as well as local field potentials, right, which are the average activity of local networks of neurons near the recording electrode. So let's just dive right in. Uh, today's topic will be working memory. Perhaps all of us know what working memory is. It's the temporary holding of information online to make it available for further processing. This definition comes to us from Alan Badley, Joaquin Fuster, Paco Murakish, other pioneers in this field. But one point, it's very one very important point to make about working memory, one that Paco Murakish repeatedly made, was that working memory is not just short-term memory. There's lots of examples in the brain of, of short-term memory buffer, but what makes working memory unique is working memory is under volitional control. It gives us executive or top-down control over our thought and action. 
Paco Murkish said it best, I think, when she said that working memory is what frees us from being civil creatures that just react to the environment and gives us our own agency. We can choose what to pay attention to, what to think about, when to act. And volition is what, what, what makes working memory so unique and special and like, such, such a central role in cognition. So this talk, I'll be talking about evidence for top-down control, executive control working memory, and alpha, beta, and gamma oscillatory dynamics in the cortex of monkeys. Now, here's an example of what we've seen uh, during a working memory, when a monkey is performing a working memory task. These are local field particles recorded from the lateral prefrontal cortex. Over here on the left, you see frequency, we're looking, in, looking at local field potentials now. We're looking at frequency on, on the y-axis time on the x-axis, the color indicates the power of the local field potential. And what's shown here is a single trial and a single electrode recording, just again, just one single trial where the monkey is cued to hold two stimuli, two pictures in working memory. Here's the first picture being presented. There's a gap in time, the second picture, and here's the working memory delay where the monkey's holding both pictures of the working memory. And what we see on the individual trial level is something a little bit different from, from the classic model of working memory. The classic model of working memory is persistent activity. Neurons fire when you, when you load a stimulus into working memory, and they just keep firing as long as they're being held in working memory. And sure, you see a few examples of neurons that do that, but the bulk of the population shows very sparse, bursty activity. And what we've seen, what others have seen shown here on this figure, what we see are there's, there's these bursts, short duration, narrow band bursts of gamma during working memory encoding and working memory storage. And these bursts of gamma are associated with the spiking that's carrying the information about the stimuli the monkey's holding in working memory. So we see the contents of working memory are being encoded and held in working memory by spiking and bursts of gamma associated with the spiking. So that's point number one. Point number two is that we also see another kind of dynamic. We see short bursts, short narrow band bursts of um, beta shown here in lower frequency here. Um, and the beta bursts that are carrying the contents of working memory are anti-correlated with, with, sorry, the gamma bursts that are, carrying the contents of working memory are anti-correlated with the beta bursts that are not carrying the contents of working memory. Only the gamma, only the, the, the spikes that are carrying the working memories are only associated with the gamma burst, not with the beta bursts. But the beta and gamma bursts are anti-correlated. So here's the example here. Now we're looking at, now we're looking at the average across trials and across electrodes. Now we're plotting instead of power, we're plotting the burst rate for both gamma gamma burst right here from 55 to 90 hertz, and the beta burst rate in, in the brown um, um, line. Again, here's time on the x-axis. Here's where the two stimuli are being presented, and here's the working memory delay. And as you see, there's an increase in gamma burst rate when the monkey's encoding both the stimuli and the working memory, and there's an increasing gamma burst rate as time goes by over the working memory delay. If you look at the beta burst rate, we see the exact opposite. Whenever gamma goes up, beta goes down. Whenever beta goes up, gamma goes down. And over the working memory delay, there's this increase in gamma as the end of the delay uh, um, comes to a close, whereas a decrease in beta. So we see, as anti we see gamma carrying the contents of working memory, and beta is anti-correlated with gamma. What is beta doing if it's not carrying the contents of working memory? Well, a number of investigations in my laboratory going back over a decade now has shown that beta carries top-down information. The top-down information, like the task rules, the monkey needs to solve a task. So now we have two different dynamics here. Gamma dynamics are carrying the contents of working memory associated with the spiking carrying the contents of working memory. And beta dynamics that are carrying the top-down information um, about the task rule, the monkey needs to perform the task, and the two are anti-correlated one another. Can I request that, that people mute their speakers because somebody's background um, audio is coming through? Please mute your microphones. Now, these beta gamma dynamics and the working memory, they actually look different across different layers of cortex. We use a bunch of recordings using so-called laminar or multi-contact probe electrodes where we can sync an electrode down the layers of cortex. And they have multi-contacts so you can look at activity from all the different layers of cortex simultaneously. 
and we can find the middle layer of cortex, which is indicated here by zero on the dotted line, by seeing more information where there's a burst of activity when a, when a stimulus information first comes into the cortical, cortical column. Uh, that would be correspond to layer four. So the first thing we found is that the working memory spiking, the spiking that's carrying the contents of working memory are most strongly in, in the superficial layers of cortex. So we see here they're, they're spiking in all layers of cortex that are carrying some um, of the working memory content, but, but by far it's much stronger in the superficial layers of cortex. And here's an example of a working memory task. Now we're looking at layers of cortex on the y-axis, time on the x-axis. Here's where we're presenting the cue to the animal, and this is the memory delay, and most of the multi-unit activity carrying the working memories are in the superficial layers of cortex. That makes sense because the superficial layers of cortex are the feed forward layers of cortex. They carry information from sensory cortex in the back of the brain to frontal cortex in the front of the brain. So the superficial layers are the feed forward layers of cortex. That's where sensory information should be and that's where we find that it is. Now if we look across different layers of cortex. Again, here's cortical layer now on the y-axis. Again, with middle layer is zero. And now we're looking at power of both of beta in, the, in red and gamma in the blue. And as we see, gamma is stronger in the superficial layers of cortex. Again, that makes sense because the gamma, as I showed in the previous slide, gamma is associated with the spiking that's carrying the sensory stimuli the monkey's holding a working memory. So given that gamma is associated with sensory information, it should be in the feed board or superficial layers of cortex. But beta, Beta carrying the top-down information, beta is stronger in the deep layers of cortex. And that makes sense because the deep layers of cortex are the feedback layers of cortex. They carry information, they carry top-down information from the front of the brain to the back of the brain. So it makes sense that beta, which is carrying top-down information, is, is stronger in the deep layers of cortex, the feedback layers of cortex. And if you look at these beta gamma dynamics across the layers of cortex, we see, we, we see that the beta gamma are negatively correlated. As I showed you earlier, beta and gamma are negatively correlated, but we, now we see this taking place across the different layers of cortex. So here's the layer providing beta, superficial layers versus deep layers. Here's the layer providing gamma, deep versus superficial. Um, the colors now show the correlation with red being a positive correlation, blue being a negative correlation. And the way to interpret the slide is that beta and gamma in superficial and deep layers are negatively correlated. Whenever beta is high in the, in the deep layers of cortex, in the feedback layers of cortex, gamma is weak in the superficial layers of cortex. Whenever gamma power is high in the superficial layers of cortex, beta power is weak in the deep layers of cortex. So this anti-correlation I showed you a moment ago, but now interplaying across the different layers of cortex. And this suggests the following, that top-down information is carried um, by beta, dy beta uh, oscillatory dynamics in the deep feedback layers of cortex, and it has an inhibitory influence on the gamma in the superficial feed-forward layers of cortex that are feed-forwarding sensory information from the back of the brain to the front of the brain, thereby providing a way by which top-down information about what the animal should do can gate access to work the, the gamma dynamics that are actually holding the contents of working memory. In other words, beta can turn on and off the faucet of working memory storage by turning on and off gamma in the superficial layers of cortex. Now, the way us neuroscientists, neurophysiologists often look at behavioral relevance and stuff is you look to see whether the um, whatever phenomenon we're looking at can actually predict behavioral errors. Now, I'm not going to walk you through this slide. It's a very complex one, and this is all published. So you can go look at the details. But the point of this is that we, 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 look, we examine these beta-gamma interactions while the monkey was performing a complex delayed match to sequence task, in which it saw a sequence of two objects at the start of a the delay, then at the end of the delay had to respond yes or no with a lever, in, lever release about whether the a test sequence of stimuli match the earlier sample sample sequence. So this is a match because these two pictures are the same as the one the monkey saw earlier. And a non-match sequence could be different pictures or the same pictures in the wrong order or one picture right or one picture wrong, et cetera. So the behavioral response didn't tell us why the monkey made an error. 
However, using deviations from the beta gamma dynamics on correct trials, we could tell why the monkey was making an error. We could tell whether the monkey got the sequence wrong, got the first stimulus wrong, got the second stimulus wrong, got the order wrong. We could tell by looking at deviations from the beta gamma dynamics seen on correct trials, why the monkey made an error, which we could not tell from spiking activity alone. Spiking could tell us whether the monkey is going to make an error, but didn't tell us why the monkey made an error. Only the only the different levels of beta gamma um, power told us why the monkey made an error. So this suggests the follow following model. Top-down information is carried by alpha, beta in the uh, deep layers of um, cortex. And I'll get, I've been talking about beta so far, why I'm also including alpha here, I'll get to in just a second. Basically, alpha and beta exist, they're the same thing, they exist along a continuum. So top-down information is carried in the deep layers of cortex, feedback layers of cortex by alpha-beta dynamics. Deep layer alpha-beta regulates superficial layer alpha-beta, which indirectly inhibits or gates and controls the gamma and spiking in the superficial layers that, that, that store things in working memory, thereby providing top-down control of a working memory. It can turn on and off working memory storage. Now, but after we um, um, were considering this work and we, we, we interpreted so far in terms of recordings from the prefrontal cortex and in a working memory context, it occurred to us, well, why, why is this just apply to working memory and frontal cortex? Some new results from our lab have shown that these same dynamics between alpha, beta, and gamma in, dupe, in deep versus superficial layers of cortex, we've seen this in, in recent work, we've seen this all over cortex. We've seen it in frontal cortex, parietal cortex, visual cortex. We've seen it in auditory cortex, uh, um, area V4. We see everywhere we look, we're seeing the same dynamics. And in fact, the they, just a side note, the increase in um, frequency of the cortical hierarchy. So alpha, which is well known to play a role in top-down attentional control and visual cortex, gradually becomes beta as you, as you ascend the cortical hierarchy. So this suggests that similar mechanisms are at play all over cortex. So what we did is we, we looked at this, whether, whether these alpha, beta, and gamma dynamics could play, can, can support something known as predictive coding, something we've heard about in, in, in the talks earlier today. Just for a brief review, predictive coding is the brain makes mental models of the environment. Um, they generate ongoing predictions of forthcoming sensory inputs, like what's happening in the next few seconds or next second or so. Predictive inputs are suppressed because they're not, they're not informative because you were able to predict them. And only unexpected inputs, prediction errors, are fed forward to update the mental model because unexpected inputs, because you didn't expect them, you need to update your model to make it a better model. Now, most models of the, so predictive coding, lots of evidence for predictive coding. We'll hear more from Carl Friston tomorrow, perhaps. Um, but most models of the neural implementation of predictive coding use specialized prediction error circuits. At each level of cortex, there's a special set of circuits that look at the mismatch between an incoming sensory input and whether it matches the prediction. Well, we think well, there may be a more parsimonious explanation by looking at these alpha, beta, gamma dynamics. Namely, that predictions are carried by alpha, beta, um, top-down inputs, uh, sorry, um, predictions are carried by top-down alpha, beta, feeding back from the higher cortical areas to lower cortical areas that inhibit the gamma and spiking in the pathways that process the sensory inputs corresponding to stimuli that are predicted to appear in the, in the immediate future. And if that's what alpha beta is doing, is inhibiting the, uh, the uh, pathways that process predicted inputs, that means that prediction errors, things that you don't expect to see, they are simply the result of gamma and spiking occurring in pathways that were not inhibited, that were unaffected by the alpha beta predictions. So in order to um, look at this, we started with a very simple paradigm where the monkey was just doing a delayed match a sample task. So we knew the monkey was always paying attention to the stimuli. And the animal switched between a block of um, 50 trials where the same sample was used on every single trial. So the monkey always knew it was gonna be the same object for the, for, for, uh, the next 50 trials or so. And then we switched to a block where the, the um, sample stimuli in the, in, the, in, the, in the delayed match a sample task were randomly chosen from a set of three or four objects. So the samples were unpredictable. And we recorded from um, laminar electrodes, so we can record from all layers of cortex in the prefrontal, parietal, and visual cortex. Whoops, in particular, um, 
prefrontal cortex, frontal eye fields, LIP in area 7A and area V4. And this is what we found. First thing, so the way I've talked about the alpha beta dynamics so far is that they're playing a generic role in just merely turning on and off working memory storage. You want to um, turn on working memory storage. You decrease alpha beta that allows gamma to be expressed. Working mem things can be stored in working memory. You want to clear out working memory, you do the opposite. You turn up alpha beta, that shuts down gamma, you clear out working memory. That's just a general turning on and off of the faucet. But with a much more powerful mechanism, and one that is needed if this if these dynamics play a role in predictive coding, is the effects of the alpha, beta, and gamma dynamics have to be stimulus selective. It has to be able to target not just turning on and off um, working memory storage, turning on and off encoding in general, but it has to turn on and off encoding of particular stimuli. And that's exactly what we found. So what we did, this now is a plot here of the, um, for each recording site in area V4, back in visual cortex, we determine which um, stimuli of the three or four stimuli we use for a given session, which one were the preferred stimulus, the one that activated the most neurons at that particular recording site in area V4, versus the least preferred stimulus, the one that activated or less strongly activated the neurons at that recording site in area V4. Then using that information about the recording site, what, which, which objects, which stimuli the, the, that recording site preferred, we then looked at the alpha, beta, and gamma power. So here's the gamma power at, rec at recording sites where the, um, that's actually the difference in gamma power. This is um, the gamma power to an unpredicted uh, a block of uh, gamma power when the animal was, was um, performing a block of of delay match a sample to unpredictable stimuli. So stimuli were randomly chosen with the gamma power to predictable stimuli where the same stimulus used all the time subtracted from it. So on the up on the y-axis is higher gamma to unpredictable samples and lower on the, on the y-axis is higher gamma power to predictable samples. And here on the left is the deep layers of area V4 and here on the right is the superficial layers in V4. And what we found is that there was stronger increases in gamma to unpredictable um, sample stimuli, especially in the superficial layers of cortex, when that object, when that sample stimulus was the preferred stimulus for that particular recording site in area V4. So the highest increase in gamma in, superfi in superficial layers of cortex in area V4 were to unpredictable preferred objects. There was an increase in gamma to a preferred object if it was predictable, but it was much weaker than the increase in gamma to an unpredictable object. In other words, an object that was more or less a prediction error. Now, when we look, then look at the alpha beta, we see the opposite. So now we're looking at the alpha beta power here in deep layers versus superficial layers. And um, on the top of the y-axis is higher beta power, alpha beta power to unpredictable stimuli. And the lower part of the y-axis is higher alpha beta power to predictable stimuli. And we see the opposite here. Now we're seeing the stronger effects in deep layers of cortex as predicted instead of the superficial layers of cortex. And we see an increase, higher increase in alpha beta power to the object that is preferred by that particular recording sites versus, un, un, versus least preferred. So we're seeing these alpha, beta, gamma dynamics are not just a generic turning on and off of storage or bottom-up processing, but they're actually targeting specific representations of specific stimuli in visual cortex. Okay, now we also see the same sort of thing at play when we look at um, coherence and at, at, um, secreting between areas. So this is an example of just the, again, now we're looking at the coherence between, in this case, frontal eye fields in area V4, with the coherence during unpredictable samples, with the coherence during predictable trample, um, samples subtracted out. So again, higher to unpredictable is up, higher to higher coherence to unpredictable is up, higher higher coherence to predictable samples is on is down, and we see that for alpha beta, there's higher coherence between frontal cortex and sensory cortex. Um, um, higher coherence in the alpha beta range when, this, when the sample stimuli were predictable and higher um, gamma coherence between them when the uh, stimuli were unpredictable. Uh, and by the way, you, know, you don't often see theta. In, theta is fairly weak in cortex. You don't often see it, but when you do, it tends to track it, um, go along with gamma. 
And we see this taking place between all the areas. So here's the, here's the patterns of gamma coherence when the objects are unexpected, unpredictable. The arrows indicate the significant greater coherence between these, these air, cortical areas when, this, when the stimuli were unpredictable. And the boxes indicate inter coherence within the area. So we see there's, an, there's a big increase in coherence uh, in gamma between areas and strong um, increases in gamma coherence within area V4 um, when, when the stimuli are unpredictable. And when we look at the predictable, we see the, largely see the opposite. There's more alpha beta coherence when the objects are predictable. It's not perfect um, matching up. In fact, in general, we're finding across all, all you know, a bunch of experiments, area 7A is just kind of weird compared to, compared to the rest of the cortex. And I can unpack that in Q&A if you want. But generally, we see when, when, the, when stimuli are unpredictable, we need a lot of like a feed forward processing of unexpected inputs. There's a lot of gamma coherence between and within areas. And then when the stimuli are predictable, we see a lot of alpha beta coherence, uh, both within and, and between areas. So this, in sum, this, this suggests the following model that again, that predictions are carried in, in predictive coding, predictions are carried by alpha beta that inhibits from in deep layers of cortex that inhibits the gamma spiking in, in superficial layers in the pathways that process sensory inputs. So if a predicted stimulus comes along, you get weaker activation, weaker feed forwarding of that predicted input because it's already been inhibited by the alpha beta feeding back from the front of the brain to the back of the brain. But if an unexpected stimulus comes along, a prediction error, you get lots of gamma and uh, spiking to that unpredicted stimulus because it, is, is, it has not been inhibited by the alpha beta that allows it to feed forward fully to the uh, um, anterior cortex where the predictive models can be um, updated to make better predictions in, in the future. So I thank you for your attention and I'm um, more than happy to take questions now. Yes, I think we can. Uh, there are a couple of questions. I'm not sure. One is mine. Yeah, if we sure. ask a question, yeah. folks. But maybe we should uh, maybe invite uh, Dmitry if he wants to uh, to ask his question. Yeah. So Dmitry asks: Do interactions uh, gamma and beta yeah. play a similar role in the motor cortex? Yeah, I'm inviting him. <laughs> Yeah, they do. We think that this is this is a, this is a cortical-wide infrastructure for for top top-down control. So for example, in motor cortex, what you see is if if the monkey or person is inhibiting a, a motor response, you see lots of beta, lots of beta, lots of beta, very little gamma. Then the moment the animal is cued to to now you can move, the beta drop, the gamma goes up, and then there, there's a, um, a motor response. So I think it's the same dynamics, basically ubiquitous across cortex. It's a general cortical canonical circuit for top-down control. Yeah, we lost uh, Randy, so maybe, yeah, Dmitry, do you have a follow-up or can you hear us? I, we can't hear you. Can't hear you. We can't hear you. Oh, wait, wait, wait. No, you, you, you can type if you want or no problem. So uh, my question was about theta. So you showed some results about theta coherence. So what could mm -hmm. the functional role of theta be? Is it similar to, to gamma or? No, what theta is doing is that, according to the model we, we were uh, testing when we first did these working memory experiments is a model by M Michael Lundqvist. Mm -hmm. And what you need, the idea is that it was mainly a model for how to hold multiple items of working memory. And the idea that these gamma bursts if you're holding more than one stimulus in working memory, like say two objects, the different gamma bursts correspond to the different stimuli. And you need to keep the gamma bursts separated in time and also in frequency so you don't get interference between the memories. And that's what theta does in that model. The gamma bursts are actually tied to the under underlying theta rhythm. And by having different 
memories be a, a different gamma bursts be activated on different theta cycles, you can keep the, um, the memory separate from one another. And when we look at our gamma dynamics in frontal cortex during these tasks, we do see that cross-frequency coupling to theta. We see that the gamma is modulated by an underlying theta. Even when you can't even quite see the theta because the theta is kind of weak in cortex, you still see the gamma modulated by theta. I see. Yeah, thanks. I think we have a couple more questions here. Let's see. Uh, yeah. So somebody asks, or yeah, in terms of attention, is there a similar interplay of alpha, beta, and gamma? Yes, of course. Oh uh. uh, yeah, there is. So back in in the visual cortex, numerous studies have shown that when you're attending, let's say you you have a neurons that correspond to a certain location on the computer screen, if I shift my attention over here, what happens is there's an increase in, in alpha. Uh, at that site and the spike in the gamma drops. So it's the same dynamics, but people when people talk about motor control and now working memory, we've talked about beta and gamma in, um, in frontal cortex. When people talk about uh, vi visual cortex and, and um, top-down attention, they mainly talk about um, alpha. And there was a question, are these the same phenomenon? Well, in the recent paper we have that, um, that we have impressed in Journal of Cognitive Neuroscience, we see that alpha, beta, and alpha and beta are, pretty, are the same thing. They exist along a continuum. In, back, in the back of the cortex, it's alpha. As you move forward, it gradually becomes lower beta. So the alpha, beta, we think, are, are, the, are the exact same, not the exact same, but the same functional band, just it just changes slightly in frequency across cortex in a systematic way. Yeah. Great. Uh, another question talks about us about uh, dop the role of dopamine. You talked about prediction errors, right? And it's known that reward prediction errors, for example, relate to dopaminergic signals. So, yeah. So the question is, yeah, what is the role of dopamine in these alpha, beta, and gamma oscillation interactions? Yeah, great question. We haven't looked at that yet. I mean, the uh, dopamine plays a big modulatory role in cortex. We've seen that in other studies where we haven't looked at uh, um, beta ga um, gamma dynamics yet, but I, I would I would imagine they are going to play that kind of role in in, uh, in modulating the the tone in cortex and whether you see expression of, of gamma gamma, for example, that would be the prediction, and we, we hope to see it. We're actually going back to the we have some data where we had the animal do a working memory and a learning task where we um, where we um, uh, um, piped in dopa, dopamine antagonists. We're hoping to see whether those those dynamics play out as predicted in that data. If not, well, it wasn't a, a working memory experiment per se. But there's always a, you know, always do future, more experiments in the future. Great. Yep. Thanks so much. So I think we can wrap up. And thank you so much again. We lost Randy. I think his connection was is not great. So we'll, I'll try to bring him back, and uh, we'll take a two minute break, and then have the next talk. Thanks so much, sir. Sure, thank you. So there we go. Randy, are That's you very strange because I, I was yeah, seeing I, and hearing. Okay. I think you're, you, it might have to do with the, the bandwidth, your connection bandwidth. But it's, I'm glad you're back, so you can take the lead again. We'll invite yeah. Uh, Beth. Yeah. Let me try. Yeah, indeed. The, the next speaker, right? Yep. Who is uh, Beth Buffalo? Sorry. And should I do that now? Uh, I'm, I'm inviting her on screen, and I'll okay. let you yeah, right. no, wait. do the rest. Yeah. Okay. Um, Whoops. Whoops. No, it's fine. I mean, I, I just uh, disappeared, okay. leaving you alone. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so we should have Beth in a minute with us. It says, uh -huh. accept the connection. There we are. Hi. Hi, Elizabeth. Do you hear me? I do. Can you hear me? Yes, I hear you. Great. So, uh, do you know how to share your screen? Let me tell you something that's important. When you do the share the screen, be sure you share the whole screen, not a window. Because if you just share the window, we can't see your cursor. We can't see the pointer. Uh, right. But if you share the whole screen, okay. Uh, so I think we're ready for your uh, talk. It's uh, my pleasure to introduce our second speaker this afternoon, Beth Buffalo. Take it away, Beth. Great. Thank you very much. Um, hi, everyone. Um, let's see. I think my mask is in my bag. All right. Can you see that okay? 
Can you see my screen okay? Yes, fine. I think we are also looking at your uh, background, you know, the, both slides. Maybe you want to share the other screen with the full, uh, the full screen. Let's see. Dimitri, you want to mute me because if there's a lot of background here. Is that better? Yep. Okay. Perfect. Um, all right. Well, thank you, uh, Dimitri and Randy and Earl, for inviting me to participate in this. I've been uh, watching and uh, seeing all the talks so far today, which have been really incredible. And um, it's great to follow Earl. Uh, it's hard to follow Earl, but uh, it's great because he uh, talked about a lot of the things that, uh, that I'll also be talking about. Uh, so a nice uh, sort of you'll have uh, some background uh, getting into to my work, which will focus on the hippocampus. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, trying to reconcile the spatial and mnemonic views of the hippocampus. And um, our work really takes its motivation from early work from uh, case studies, including uh, predominantly the case study of patient HM, who suffered memory damage after having, um, or memory loss after having an operation that removed his medial temporal lobes bilaterally. And so this really set the stage for thinking of the role of the hippocampus um, and uh, in memory and predominantly being a role in setting up long-term memories, not the kind of working memory um, that Earl was talking about, but more um, long-term declarative episodic memories. But at the same time, uh, starting in about the early 70s, there was uh, really beautiful work by John O'Keefe and his colleagues, and then followed up by the Mosers um, and lots of other groups, uh, Bruce McNaughton, Carol Barnes, showing really exquisite spatial representations um, in uh, single neurons in the rodent hippocampus. And so these uh, two bodies of work really done in different species, so humans and rodents, and also with different techniques. So mostly um, behavioral tasks in humans and single, year, single unit neurophysiology in rodents really set up this um, sort of debate in the field about how best to understand the role of the structure, um, whether we should think of it mostly as a memory structure or um, more as a, st a structure that might be important for navigation because of all these beautiful spatial representations. Um, in my lab, we study uh, the same structure, so the hippocampus and the surrounding cortex, uh, but using the rhesus monkey, the macaque model. Um, and this allows us to uh, have the monkeys perform a lot of the same kinds of behavioral tasks that uh, people had studied in humans, um, but also being able to do the single unit neurophysiology, um, similar to the studies that had been performed in rodents. So I'm gonna tell you about a little bit of this work today. And most of the studies that I'm gonna tell you about focused on our analysis of the animal's eye movements. And so just to set this up, I wanna tell you about some work uh, that really was pioneered by Alfred Yarbus uh, back in the 60s, where he demonstrated that you could tell a lot about cognition by studying eye movements. And so in this example, he had subjects uh, looking at this painting and in white, you can see the subject's scan path, the way they move their eyes as they were um, instructed to just examine the painting freely. And then on the right, you can see the, the change in the scan path when the subjects were just given a different instruction. So now they were told to estimate the material circumstances of the family. And what this just suggests or indicates is that you can use the scan path to really um, probe a certain form of cognition, that eye movements are not just random, but they're really instructing um, our cognition. And in my lab, we've used them to study memory. So we know that there are changes in eye movements that accompany um, the kind of memory that we know depends on the hippocampus. And so we record from the hippocampus and other structures in the medial temporal lobe while we have monkeys seated, their head fixed, and they're looking at complex images on a computer screen. And we allow them to freely move their eyes and, and view these images. And then again, use that information to tell us something about memory. But at the same time as we were watching the monkeys uh, view these stimuli, we had the idea that they were exploring the scenes, almost you know, foraging for information, kind of in the same way that rodents do when they're moving around and exploring an, an open field. And this is the kind of experiment in rodents where they had identified beautiful spatial representations. And so with my graduate student at the time, Nick, uh, Nathan Killian, uh, we decided to uh, record from the entorhinal cortex and determine whether we might find similar kinds of spatial representations that reflected this visual exploration behavior. 
So he recorded from a laminar probe, uh, kind of similar to the one that Earl just described. But here we were recording from deep in the brain uh, in the entorhinal cortex, and we were recording from all layers of the structure. And uh, surprisingly to us, uh, what Nathan found was evidence for a grid-like um, activity or grid-like behavior of neurons um, that reflected where the monkey was viewing or looking on the screen. So let me just unpack this uh, figure for a minute. So on the left here, the gray trace represents the monkey scan path. And these traces are collapsed across 200 distinct complex images. So it's really nothing about the content of the image. Here we're just mapping the scan path. Um, and then the red dots represent where the monkey was looking whenever this entorhinal neuron fired an action potential. And this is the firing rate map, the sort of heat map of this activity. And this is the autocorrelation, which uh, gives evidence for this kind of 60 degree symmetry that you find in grid cells. So this shows a kind of grid-like activity that reflects where the monkey was looking on the screen. So now this slide kind of uh, gives an overview of almost a decade of work in my lab. Um, on the right is the work from my lab, but on the left shows the, the, the previously described uh, spatial representations in rodents. So you can see evidence for place cells, which have been found in the hippocampus, grid cells, as I just described, in the entorhinal cortex, as well as border cells in the entorhinal cortex, and head direction cells. So these are cells that fire whenever the rat is moving in a particular direction, independent of its location. And then these are all the responses that we've um, identified in the monkey medial temporal lobe. So place cells in the hippocampus, grid cells and border cells in the entorhinal cortex, as well as saccade direction cells, which we think may be analogous to head direction cells. So these are cells that fire selectively for a particular trajectory of a saccade or an eye movement, um, independent of where that eye movement starts or ends. And so all of these data suggest that we can find similar kinds of spatial representations in the monkey, um, but these are based on visual exploration rather than uh, environmental exploration, as has been recorded in the rat. So this is sort of our first step in kind of linking or trying to bridge these two species or these two thoughts about the hippocampus. So first showing that at least in the primate, we can see all the same kinds of spatial representations that are present in the rodent. But all of those experiments were done with the monkeys just freely viewing 2D images. So still really not exactly the same as what had been uh, recorded in rodents. And so for the next step, we trained monkeys to perform a task where they were um, navigating in virtual space. Um, we're, we're working towards uh, wireless recordings where we can record from them moving around. But until then, we have them using a joystick to play video games uh, and move around virtual space. And I'll just show you a quick video of one of our first experiments with this. So um, down in the, the bottom right corner, you can see the monkey's hand on the joystick as he's moving around this virtual environment. His task is to find the banana and then collide with it in order to get a food reward. And so that, that beeping sound that you hear is the sound of the monkey getting an actual um, food reward delivered through a tube. And the circle on the screen shows the monkey's eye movement um, as he's looking around, exploring the environment. Um, and we identified lots of fun things about the monkey's behavior. So in this case, you can see he looked around and then he found the two bananas that were kind of clustered together so he could get to them in, in one forward motion. Um, there's evidence that monkeys can remember the location of the next closest banana, um, even when it's no longer on the screen. Um, so we may be able to, uh, to look at some working memory processes, uh, like Earl just described. Um, and from our recordings in the hippocampus, we've been able to identify spatial representations in virtual um, reality, uh, particularly in a different kind of experiment that uh, requires uh, the monkey to, to do a spatial memory task. And that's where we've been able to see um, neurons that look like they fire in particular locations in the maze. So if we think about how we might want to bridge the spatial mnemonic gap, so the first step was we know that we see spatial representations in the monkey, in the primate uh, hippocampus that look similar to what had been described in the rodent. So it's not just a species difference. Um, and then the next idea is, well, maybe the reason that this uh, structure shows both memory and spatial representations is that the neural mechanisms that support memory evolved from the mechanisms that support navigation. 
And this is really from a review that was published several years ago by Yuri Buzaki and Edvard Moser. And the idea was that maybe this certain forms of navigation, like um, this path integration or self-referenced form of navigation may have evolved to support episodic memory. And a map-based or allocentric navigation may have evolved to support semantic memory or memory for facts. And um, you know, this sort of fits with the idea that episodic memory in particular reflects a kind of mental time travel, um, traveling back in, in space and time to, to remember some event. And so if we thought about this um, idea, it seems that an important first principle is that you would be able to uh, identify spatial representations in this case, in the absence of any movement, right? If it's, if it's supposed to be able to support mental time travel, then you should be able to see these representations even without any physical movement in the space. And so I had a visiting uh, graduate student, Nicholas Bilming, who decided to test this. Um, and he set up the experiment where he trained monkeys to fixate a central uh, fixation cross. And while they were fixating this cross, they had to keep their eyes there. There was a stimulus that he moved around in the periphery and the monkey was required to pay attention to that stimulus. And we tested, we knew that he was paying attention to that stimulus because every now and then there would be a subtle luminance change. And it was pretty subtle. You may not have even seen it in this video, um, but there was a subtle luminance change. And as soon as that happens, the monkey had to release a bar to signal that, uh, that he had noticed that change and got rewarded. Um, but all the while keeping his eyes on the central cross. And so we could uh, control the location of attention by uh, controlling how we move the stimulus in the periphery, uh, but knowing that the monkey uh, was not moving, not even moving his eyes in this case. And uh, through recordings in the entorhinal cortex, um, surprisingly, uh, Nicholas was able to find grid-like activity uh, in the entorhinal cortex that reflected not any uh, movement through space, but the location of attention. So uh, reflected this, uh, this sort of movement of the stimulus, but where the monkey was attending, not where the monkey himself was moving. And so this sort of supports the idea that maybe these uh, mechanisms could support a form of mental um, space or time travel. Now let's think about the next idea, and this one really has uh, gained a lot of traction, I would say, in the field in the, in the last five or, or so years. Um, there have been several papers that, um, opinion pieces and review articles that have sort of talked about this idea. And it's the idea that the hippocampal formation serves as a cognitive map by organizing experiences and guiding behavior across all domains of cognition. So not just space and time, but any form of uh, content that we experience can be put into a map. Um, that, the, that that's actually what the hippocampus and the entorhinal cortex do is they sort of map that experience um, uh, to allow us to uh, to navigate between uh, between content as well as uh, events in space and time. And so if we think about how this might be tested, um, this was actually beautifully done uh, by a paper recently from David Tank's lab. Uh, Dmitry Oranov was the first author. And they trained rats to stay in one location. So this wasn't about moving through space. Um, and the rat had to press a lever. When they pressed the lever, there, it started a tone sweep. And the rat's job was to release the lever whenever the tone got into the target zone. And they recorded from cells in the hippocampus as well as the entorhinal cortex. Here I'm just showing you the, the CA1 hippocampal recordings. And they found evidence for neurons that mapped the entire range of this sort of auditory space suggesting again that uh, the hippocampus could provide a map for more than just space, uh, but any kind of content of cognition. In my lab, we started uh, testing this recording in the hippocampus in monkeys that have learned to do a color map task. I'll show you a video of this one. So here the monkey's job is to push the joystick as he's, uh, in one way of saying it, navigating through this color space. So he gets a couple of instruction trials. Um, the color around the outside tells the monkey which color he's looking for. And when he gets to that color, he has to release or pull back on the joystick um, to stop. And then uh, if he's in the right place or at the right color, he'll get rewarded. Um, and after he gets a couple of these cued or instruction trials, then the monkey has learned what the target stimulus is and can actually perform pretty well without having that, uh, that cue around the outside. So I'll show you a couple of these trials. 
And what we've learned is that we can train the monkeys to learn a new mapping every day. So here um, above the joystick, you can see the, the map that the monkey was trained on this day. Each day we can train them on a different map so they can learn a different sequence of colors. Um, and we're starting these recordings now in the hippocampus and, and entorhinal cortex. And we're finding evidence for cells that uh, respond to particular colors. Um, but importantly, these cells uh, respond in very complex ways that incorporate not just the color that the animal is seeing, but, um, but also the sequence. So whether that color was presented uh, one time before or is, a, is sort of in this next space in the sequence, um, as well as the relationship uh, between other task variables and the color. So that leads us uh, in the last section. I'm going to uh, now finish up with the third sort of idea about how we might bridge this spatial mnemonic gap. And um, this one really is the one that my lab is focused on the most right now and, um, and, and think that it reflects a lot of the activity that we're seeing. And this is the idea that uh, the hippocampal activity reflects the experience of the organism rather than objective reality. Um, and what that really means is instead of trying to think of all the stimuli that the experimenter is showing and sort of uh, line up the activity of the neurons to that um, ex uh, objective reality as defined by the experimenter, really we should look at uh, the internal working of the hippocampus and that the organizing principle really is the sequential activity of neuronal assemblies. So let me unpack that a little bit. Um, so what we know from uh, lots of work in rodents is that there's really a precise timing between hippocampal spikes and the ongoing oscillation of the local field potential. And thankfully, if you heard um, Earl Miller's talk, you know a lot about oscillations in the local field potential. And here I'm going to be talking about the theta band oscillation. So it's uh, that lower frequency in rats. It's around 8 hertz. And uh, what's been identified is something called theta phase precession. So as the rat moves through the place field, um, you can see this is the, the firing rate of the neuron. But what's interesting is that this neuron fires at a precise time relative to the phase of this theta band oscillation. And as the rat moves through the field, the, um, the spike or the neuron fires at an uh, earlier and earlier phase. So this is the precession. And if you look at this across many passes through the, the firing field, you see that as the rat moves through the field, it, uh, the neuron is firing at an earlier phase within this cycle. And then what's really exciting is if you look at this across the population of uh, place cells recorded simultaneously, you can see within a given theta cycle that there's this sequence of progression of firing of the different place cells um, that happen on each of the theta cycles. Now thinking about the theta band rhythm, it's, it's very obvious in rats when they're moving through uh, the environment exploring. Um, but in rats, you also see a strong phase locking of this hippocampal theta to the behaviors that they're engaged in when they're actively sensing the environment. So this is work uh, from Howard Eichenbaum's lab back in the early 80s showing that there was a phase locking between sniffing behavior of the rat and the hippocampal theta. More recently, work from Matt, Matthew Diamond's lab showing that there's this phase locking between the whisking behavior of the animals when they're engaged in a, a discrimination task, a tactile discrimination task, and the hippocampal theta. Um, as Earl mentioned, in uh, the cortex, you don't see much theta. It's pretty weak. I would say that in the hippocampus of monkeys, it's actually pretty weak as well. Um, we don't see the same kind of strong theta band oscillation that you see in rodents. Um, but we looked at the theta band uh, LFP, or we looked at theta band oscillations in the LFP while the monkeys were performing this task of uh, free viewing and uh, thinking of it as the active, same kind of active sensing, exploring the environment as sniffing and whisking is for rodents. And what we found was that there was a strong phase locking of this theta band signal in the, in the LFP relative to the saccade. So prior to the saccade, there was really no phase alignment. Um, but then after the saccade, you can see this phase reset, um, again, suggesting that this theta band oscillation is locked to this behavior of active sensing. One thing that's interesting, if you look at the behavior of monkeys and humans while they're doing this kind of free viewing task, is that the eye movements are pseudo rhythmic. So this is just showing a histogram of the fixation duration during free viewing of monkeys. 
um, with the median at about 200 milliseconds. So monkeys are moving their eyes about five times uh, a second as they're exploring the scene. I showed you the phase locking of the LFP, but we also found really interesting peristachotic activity in individual neurons. So this is a single hippocampal neuron. Um, and now I've aligned the, the, the data relative to the time of the fixation start. So that's the green line here. In this raster plot, each row represents a different fixation while the monkey is freely viewing a stimuli, the, the stimuli. And each tick mark represents uh, that neuron fire and action potential. And so what you can see is that right after the time of the um, fixation start, you get this precise burst uh, right around 80 milliseconds. Um, that's very reliable across all these different fixations. We've aligned the fixations or ranked them by their duration, and this red line shows the end of that fixation. So there is some variability in the duration of the fixations. This is the end of it. And so then you can see uh, this line represents the this sort of precise firing to the next uh, fixation. So now if we looked a little more carefully at this peripsychotic activity in the hippocampus, um, I showed you earlier that we found place cells in the hippocampus based on where the monkey was looking. And this is work by uh, Seth Koenig, who recently graduated um, from the lab. And um, these are two different neurons that showed uh, place responses in different corners of the screen. The red line shows this neuron's response whenever the monkey looked into the field. And these are the rasters. So you can see the infield responses and then in blue are the out of field responses. Now, interestingly, as he looked across the population of neurons that he found that had these kind of spatial responses, he found that they um, had different latencies in terms of when they fired relative to the fixation. So some fired right after the monkey made a fixation into the field and others fired much later, almost at the end of the fixation. And when you look at this across the population, so now each row here represents a different neuron recorded during free viewing. And the warm colors here represent where the peak of that firing uh, field is. And we just align them by that maximum firing rate. Um, we see that there's a sort of activity that tiles the entire space of the fixation. And so to us, this looks really reminiscent of the theta band sequences uh, that have been described in rodents and show that in the monkey, this really precise timing can occur relative to the, the eye movement, this active uh, response of uh, exploring or sampling the environment. So going back uh, to Yuri Buzaki, this is now a more recent review that he wrote with Dave Tingley. Um, this really, I think, gives a, a great illustration of how we're starting to think about the self-organization of the hippocampus. And so here in this uh, plot, each color represents a different neuron. And this is just lining up the neurons relative to distance along a linear track. And if you line them up this way, you could easily decode space. So you could uh, identify that different neurons represented, to a diff represented a different place along this linear track. You could also instead line the neurons up relative to time uh, in, the, in the trial. Uh, which is here, you know, pretty well correlated with distance, but you could still see that there was a nice decoding of time through the trial. Um, but when things become really clear is when you instead align things to the internal um, sort of running of the hippocampus, and that's the theta cycle. And if you line things up to that, what you see are these beautiful sequences that just get lost when you try to align things to these external variables. So with that, um, I'll just conclude. Um, so what I showed you from our work was that many of the, the hallmarks of rodent spatial representations can be identified in the primate and the hippocampus and entorhinal cortex. And this includes grid cells, uh, place cells, border cells, saccade direction cells. Um, we've recently, I didn't get to talk about it, but we've recently uh, with Maria Meister and uh, Mark Howard shown some time cells also in the entorhinal cortex. Um, and that the, but the rhythmic activity in the primate hippocampus is importantly associated with exploratory eye movements. And that maybe this peristachotic activity around the hippocampus suggests that eye movements um, like theta in the monkey, I mean, sorry, like theta in the rat, these eye movements in the monkey organize the sequential activity of neuronal assemblies. Um, now I have to have 
the caveat here that these data that I showed you were all recorded, you know, sort of three or four neurons at a time. We're now um, gearing up. We've got some large scale recordings going. So we're um, working towards being able to simultaneously record uh, tens to hundreds of neurons so that we can really look for these kind of sequences. And the, the going idea really is that hippocampal activity, um, instead of thinking of it as supporting memory uh, necessarily or spatial navigation, what it really does is it reflects the encoding of ongoing experiences of the organism. Um, and it's rather than kind of the experimenter uh, controlled um, parameters. So with that, I just want to thank my lab. Um, I mentioned people along the way who contributed to this work. I just want to point out in particular, um, John Ruckman and Mary Browning, who are really doing all of the, the um, large scale recording and the, the newer virtual reality and color game experiments. Um, and I use this, uh, this picture of my lab with our families at our holiday party. I've seen a lot of our families lately through our, um, since we're all working from home, through all of our Zoom calls. So I thought it was appropriate to include them because I know this is what everybody's juggling as they're trying to get their work done these days. Um, so thank you for your attention. Um, I guess I'll stop sharing my screen now. Thank you, Beth. I don't know, am I muted or not? I hear you. Okay, so questions. Yes. Yeah, I'll bring myself up on screen. Uh, so yeah, one of the questions. Yeah. I, I put is one. Have you re oh, no, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, uh, Dimitri. Thank you so much, Randy. Sorry for uh, interrupting you. Uh, yes, the question I asked in the, in the box was about uh, Oscillatory behavior. If if there are if you see a variability in theta uh, peak frequency between different special representations, for example, have you? I missed that. Maybe you mentioned that in your analysis. Or yeah, so it's a great question. Um, so one thing that's really clear about monkey theta, at least in the hippocampus where we've looked uh, most extensively, is it's completely different from what you see in the rat. Um, so you you know if you run a power spectrum and the, the monkey is exploring and doing this you know highly attentive task, you don't see a very clear band of theta. You see it kind of in and out in bouts. Um, and we've been able to uh, link those bouts to the eye movements. Um, but so far, you know we we're still trying to understand more about what what the theta signal might be in the monkey because we think it's so important in, in what we know from the rodents and how it structures the activity of single neurons. Um, but we just haven't seen the same thing in monkeys. And that's why the, the sort of the um, relationship of the eye movement uh, to the neural activity was so striking because it, it gives us a sense that maybe this gives us a handle on that same kind of structure that we're not getting from this uh, oscillation in the local field potential. Thank you. I have a question for both Beth and Earl. Um, and it's really a, a question really to the whole field practically. So the constantly talked about the spatial information being carried by the spikes, but the spatial information remains there when there's no spiking. And um, I wondered what your idea, what's carrying the spatial information when the neurons that are supposedly carrying it by spiking aren't spiking? That's, that's a good question. So the way that we're thinking about it is kind of reframing what the information is. Um, so what you started with was, you know, when the rat, I, th I think is when the rat is in one location, right? If he's not moving, then the, the neuron goes quiet, right? So you right. only see this. And um, so what, what we're thinking about is that really the, the information comes from the sequence that that sort of gets set off from some start starting event whether it's the beginning of the trial or some input that sort of sets off this sequence that's in some ways independent of the spatial information but it it correlates with it well right because the, the rat is moving through the environment and so you're going to see this correlation between when the neuron is firing and where the rat is but the real underlying principle is this um, sequential activity of the neural the neuronal assembly. But I think you said that when he, when he stands still. 
also Earl to the screen. He had a he had a comment. Do, do you agree, Randy? I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yes. I said uh, Earl made a comment in the chat room, but oh, maybe you can. Oh yes, yes, by all means. Yes, yes, yes. To the screen. Well, I'll do it while you are making your. Actually, I blank my screen because we got bandwidth problems. Um, you know, they don't have to look at my argument. <clears throat> It. Yeah, sorry. You went. You were going. Uh, you were saying something while Earl is uh, connecting. Oh, I, I don't want to get in Earl's way. <laughs> sorry, I missed that. What you so, what I was going to say was that in, in the model that we're testing, working memory, the original model that we tested was that there's bursts of spiking associated with gamma, and those spikes induce temporary changes changes synaptic weights that carry the memories between spiking. And that's really important because memory system based on purely persistent activity has lots of problems. It's too easy to disrupt persistent activity. You add a second stimulus, you add distractor, the representation changes. By having these synaptic weight changes carry the memories between these sparse bursts of spiking, you eliminate all, of the, all those problems. That's great. I think that that really goes along well with this idea of kind of having these neuronal assemblies. And what's important is the relationship between the neurons and sort of uh, the sequences that get they get carried out versus an individual neuron firing, you know, uh, tonically or, or or carrying this having the sustained response. Yeah, and the other thing to keep exactly and the other thing to keep in mind is that uh, you know spikes cost a lot of a lot of energy. It makes much more sense to have a system built up, working memory system where and so there's occasional spikes, and that's helped along by the synaptic weight changes because it's much more en energy e efficient, in addition to all the computational and functional uh, problems it solves. Yep. You can. That's the best introduction to my. I'm glad you called yeah, attention to the you know. cost of those spikes. <laughs> I'm glad you called attention to the cost of those spikes that the uh, widely or, uh, ignored in recurrent neural net modeling. Not by us. <laughs> All right, so we got five minutes now, and then Dimitri's on. Is that, or do you want to go on right away, Dimitri? Uh, we can, yeah, in two minutes. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, maybe we have some more questions. Let me try to go through. So. Uh, oh yeah, we do. Oh, yeah. Yes. Okay. Good. Um, yeah, uh, there is a question by Jean Marc. Have you looked at replay of activity in the tasks you used when the monkey's dozing off? Yeah, really, it's a great question. So we have started recording now. Um, so we've trained the monkeys to work for a bit on the task, and then we turn the lights off, turn everything off, um, and they get a nap for about 20 or 30 minutes. And then they work again, and then they get another nap. And they get really used to this schedule, and so they uh, pretty quickly fall asleep as soon as we uh, kind of shut everything down. And um, we've been really excited to see very clear evidence of sharp wave ripples during these sleep episodes. Um, and with the large scale recordings that we're doing, I didn't have time to talk about it today, but we can see uh, how these, we're starting to understand how these ripples propagate through the hippocampus. Um, so we're in the early stages of this, but this is definitely uh, looking at replay or looking at kind of those uh, sequences on a compressed time scale is something that we're really interested in. Great. Okay, Rani, are you around? So uh, yes, uh, just a second, let me turn my video back on here. Yes, um, so it's now my very great pleasure to uh, introduce the man who really did 95 or 99% of the organizing of this wonderful workshop. Uh, so Dimitri, please take it away. Thank you so much, uh, Randy and Earl, of course, for your help. It was more uh, important than uh, than you, you've, you've uh, communicated to people. Let me try to share my screen one second. Here, how do I do that? Let's see. Going back. Uh, yep. Okay, I'm going to toggle out of mine. Be able to see my, my screen now, hopefully. Yep. So yeah, so I'm going to talk uh, about some uh, work in my lab uh, and also in collaboration with uh, Earl's lab. So in my lab, uh, we. Uh, pursue research in three directions. The first is developing new tools for brain scans. The second is developing brain theories based on deep neural networks and Bayesian brain hypothesis like predictive coding. 
And the third direction is testing tools uh, and theories in healthy people and patients using human data. So here I'll talk about uh, the second direction, developing brain theories. And uh, I'm so fortunate uh, having these two excellent talks before mine that introduced all the key, uh, or many of the key ideas much better than I could ever do. This is joint work with uh, Earl, like I said, and uh, uh, other people from uh, from uh, the Miller Lab, Scott Brinkat, and also Marcus Siegel, who is now in Tubingen. So we are focusing uh, on information processing in the brain, which has motivated early behavioral uh, behaviorist studies, uh, like studies of rewards and reflexes. It has also um, offered, let's say, or sparked the development of early neural network models based on neuroscience principles uh, in, uh, in early connectionist networks, like the one you see here on the on the right, where hidden units represent stimulus information. Then the whole field of human neuroimaging is about correlating patterns of neural activity to observe behavior. Till the recent deep neural network re revolution, uh, where these systems, to some extent, there, there's uh, lots of belief in the field that they really mimic uh, real brain architecture and function because uh, the, of the impressive performance that they can achieve in complicated tasks. So this is all about uh, different ways to uh, address and consider information processing in the brain. And at the very bottom of, uh, and at the basis, the most, one of the most fundamental notions of information processing in the brain and how this is achieved is neural ensembles, is cell assemblies that we beautifully heard from uh, Beth Stock. And also, ELF has done amazing work and has pioneered their study and their uh, experimental, uh, uh, let's say, identification. So what we see here is a video from the Adventist Lab at uh, Berkeley. And hopefully, you can see that. So that's the uh, that's experiment uh, here does, and basically the animal has a microscope on its head, as you can see, and when uh, and he's running uh, on this treadmill, and then there are images uh, being presented to it, and different groups of neurons are activated. So this is similar to the special uh, uh, map story or the cognitive map story that uh, Beth uh, explained. Uh, on the right here, you see similar results with again with optical imaging for different oriented bars that you see on the top left of these uh, panels. So different use groups of neurons again being coactivating, firing sort of synchronously, and this firing supports um, memory or stimulus representation. L and uh, his students have shown, and Tim Bushman in this case, uh, that these um, stimulus representations can also carry abstract information, or stimulus induced representations can carry abstract information. Here we have uh, multi electron arrays that El showed in his uh, talk. These are the circles that you see here, and the lines in these uh, two panels, the blue and red, correspond to linear correlations between pairs of electrodes. And you see that these pairs of uh, correlations, of pairwise correlations, change depending on the rule or the context of the, uh, of the task that the uh, monkey is performing. With fMRI, we have this also, these uh, cognitive maps here, it's numerosity. Uh, that were observed in Ben Harvey's work. You see, this is posterior parietal cortex. As you go from medial to lateral areas, you have numerosity increasing. So this is what we want to consider here. And basically what I want to discuss is some ways, some mathematical ways of obtaining insights into what these ensembles represent in terms of semantic, semantic content. Do they represent sensory information or abstract uh, notions like categories? So what is the level of abstraction of uh, the representations maintained by these groups of neurons? And also, we want to have insights also into their structure and the effective connectivity between the neurons uh, that comprise an ensemble or, or cell assembly, as uh, Herb uh, was calling it. So and to this, um, to this end, we'll use some tools from dynamical systems, graph theory, and the information theory, and also some uh, neural networks uh, like LSTMs and variational autoencoders encoders and monkey data from Earth's lab. So in the first study 
Uh, like I said, I want to focus on category representations, the semantic content of neuron ensembles. And I'll use uh, recurrent neural networks, in particular, long short term memory networks, LSTMs. The reason for picking LSTMs among the zoo of RNNs is that they have some practical advantages like preventing catastrophic effects due to vanishing and exploding gradients. You see here the different equations uh, that describe the constituent parts of uh, an LSTM for the forget gate, the update gate, etc. Now, why RNNs? Because uh, learning categorical representation relies on learning temporal correlations. And uh, this goes back to von der Malzburg and uh, the uh, start of binding theory, basically in the brain, that uh, was introduced by him. And RNNs, because of this recurrent connectivity indeed, are very efficient in learning uh, temporal correlations. So we picked those. And we also had monkey data similar to some of the tasks that uh, Earl talked about. This is a task uh, with um, uh, a, a flexible decision-making task, sensory motor decision-making, where the monkey has to fixate uh, First, and then there is a queue. Then there is a stimulus. The stimulus is a cloud of random dots. And then the monkey uh, makes a saccade to give the response. So what are the queues? The queues are one of these four different shapes. And what does the monkey have to do? It has to categorize either the motion direction of this cloud of random dots or the color. And how does it know what to do? It knows what to do based on these shapes here, the queues that are presented before the stimulus, basically. So we have many different, seven different colors and seven different motion directions that you see here or in panel B. Uh, so the, on the vertical axis, you have uh, color, different colors. On the horizontal axis, different motion directions. The data we analyzed uh, come, uh, are from the epoch after the stimulus and before the response. So stimulus answer to the average response latency because we know that this is when we have motion and color information in the cortical network. And here is a network that uh, Marcus and they are recorded from. So it has higher visual areas, IP and before, and T also parietal areas like LIP and frontal like FEF and uh, LPFC. So what we did is we asked what is its brain area and the neurons that are activated by its stimulus computing? Do they compute uh, sensory signals, they do sensory processing, or do they compute categories? And recall that the task is about categorization. It's about saying the monkey telling us if it's what it sees, the color is more green or greenish or reddish along this direction, or the motion is more upwards or downwards. So it's basically two categories in its uh, sensory domain that the monkey has to decide upon. So we built a long uh, short term memory network with six layers equal to the number of brain areas that uh, we we're recording from. We train it with back propagation and max norm regularization and dropout and empty input. And we took, importantly, two variants of this LSTM network, variants in terms of what computation, what uh, they were performing or what they were asked to, uh, uh, to categorize. So one network was trained using all possible colors or motion directions. So in this case, we assume that it performs sensory processing and we call this sensory network. The other, the second variant, I said I have two variants for each of the task, the color and the emotion. The other does categorization, so the labels are zeros and ones, are green or red category, up or down category. And then what we want to do is we take predictions from these two variants for its task, and we compare these predictions to brain data recorded from the deep neural network uh, in the brain, basically all these areas that you see again in panel A here. So the way to compare network predictions with brain responses is through representation similarity analysis introduced by Nigel Fricke-Scott and colleagues several years ago. This is based on representation dissimilarity matrices, RDMs, and a quick recap what an RDM is, for those of you who don't remember that well. So uh, basically, it's entry in this matrix of conditions times conditions. So here the conditions, of course, are the seven different colors and the seven different motion directions. So this is what we have here. Uh, so it's entry here in this matrix is the correlation between the brain recordings or the neural network predictions of the same task and uh, that correspond to the different experimental conditions. So these are correlations here and we can have, like I said, a brain RDM 
and also a network RDM, depending on what time series we consider. We can also have uh, a third kind of representation similarity matrix that we will use later, which we call the sensory dissimilarity matrix. Here, instead of uh, uh, having time series from the neural network or the brain recordings, we have uh, basically color indices or motion direction indices. So we put all possible stimuli in, in space, and then we consider uh, how close basically uh, its stimulus level is to its uh, to any other stimulus level. So we have correlations talking about the, the similarity between different uh, stimuli. And this sensory and category similarity matrices are the behavioral model that encapsulates the topography or geometry of the stimulus space. So first, remember our question is how can we compare brain activity in the cortical network in its area with neural network predictions? We compare basically brain RDMs and first sensory RDM or second, the category network RDM. So here we have something called correlations uh, of correlations or deviations that tell us how similar brain responses and neural network predictions are. And we had two criteria for assessing this similarity. Correlations basically because deviations are one minus correlation between the brain RDMs and the network RDMs, and also those correlations that were significant, basically, and the main significant one we control for using partial correlations uh, for other predictors. And also we used uh, the Bayesian information criterion that we heard this morning in Vijay's talk to do some uh, post-talk validation of our results. Basically, we see which of the two models, the sensory network or the category network, explains better or is more similar to the brain uh, recordings, basically. So the one, the network out of these two that is more similar uh, allows us to conclude that the computation that its brain area performs is either sensory processing or categorization. Here you see the results from the color task. So we have six panels because we have uh, six brain areas, you see MT, LIP, etc. In each panel, let's focus on the top left, MT, we have six pairs of bars. Again, six pairs is... Uh, because we have six layers equal to the number of uh, brain areas from which we record. And then in each pair, we have a blue bar on the left and a red bar on the right, which are the deviations uh, between the, uh, the brain RDM and or the brain responses and the network that does uh, sensory processing, the blue bars, or categorization, the red bars. And you can see with the naked eye, although this, is fo this follows up using a strict uh, statistical analysis, that the blue bars in general are smaller than the red bars. So most areas, uh, their computation is similar to sensory processing, to the, to the predictions of the sensory neural network, which tells us that basically, although it's a categorization task, this categorization occurs already using sensory signals in early. Uh, might be that this uh, uh, information exists already in the activity of red green opponent cells, uh, indeed, categorized between red and, and green uh, chromatic uh, content. We also know that we can do color decoding in early visual areas, and this is another indication about the, the validity of this result. Now, the, the motion task is very different. Here, as you see, the red bars are smaller uh, than the blue bars. So it seems that, indeed, the most brain areas uh, compute categories basically, when the magic has to categorize for motion direction. And we know, of course, that this is indeed, for example, at uh, MT, this is what it does. It computes motion integration and perceptual boundaries. We also know that uh, decision integration occurs in LIP as well, and this is broadcast to earlier visual areas. There is an exception, FEF, uh, that prefers sensory processing also in the motion task. And of course, we know this is the area that creates a topographic map uh, basically uh, that will uh, allow the monkey to perform the saccad. So it has explicit uh, special, special result information as opposed to categorical information. Uh, how can we validate these results? Uh, we can use the behavioral model. So first of all, uh, what you see on the top here in, on this table that uh, has a title computation selectivity is the results I just talked to you about is basically for the two tasks, motion or color, for the first and second row here, uh, its brain area that you see uh, the acronym here 
is it more similar to the sensory network or the category network? That's what we summarize here. And basically, I told you uh, very quickly what the conclusions were. Now, I have a second here um, table at the bottom where I talk about domain selectivity. This is a similar story where we compare the brain RDMs, the brain responses, not to the network predictions, the network RDMs, but to the uh, static sensory and category dissimilarity matrices that describe, as I said, the topography or geometry of the stimulus or category domain. And of course, this, uh, uh, this analysis does not leverage the richness of temporal dynamics that RNNs, of course, exploit and all this temporal learning of temporal correlations. Uh, however, we expect to have some consilience between the two uh, methods. Again, this is independent, of course, if we use the uh, the behavioral model, this is completely independent for RNN analysis we did before. We find uh, results that are in agreement with what we had found before. So, for example, you see the red circle here for V4. Uh, when we look at the computation selectivity in the motion task, it computed categories. And indeed, here, again, in the motion task, the first row, V4 in uh, uh, likes motion categories. Here we have, of course, four different behavioral uh, models or RDMs, the sensory motion, category motion, and so on. Same thing for uh, for the other task. In the color task, it computed uh, sensory signals before. Here, again, in the color task, the second row, again, there's sensory color information that is, uh, that to which it is uh, selective. So, uh, wrapping up this first study, uh, the first core message is that representations in the same area for the same stimulus depend on task, so they're context dependent. The motion tasks, like we said, seem to rely more on categorization, while the color uh, seem to be driven by sensory signals and computations. And we suggested an approach for really uh, understanding sensory and categorical representations by using both RNNs and behavioral models. More broadly, I would argue that classification of sensory signals is not decision making. So categorization is about forming functional groupings of sensory drive into learned categories by combining fit forward information like we heard in, uh, in the in Earl's beautiful talk with information that embodies learned categories. So it's not enough to uh, add a sigmoidal linearity at the top layer of a deep neural network, a CNN or an RNN, and say this performs categorization because categories are very distinct, uh, uh, have very distinct representations compared to uh, sensory signals. If we want to have, let's say, neural network architecture, we did not do that here, but uh, it's able to do transfer learning to do both a color task and a motion task in this case. We see that an architecture where representation content of each layer would be fixed is not sufficient. It needs to be flexibly uh, changing between tasks. So, and this is an example of how results of this sort uh, coming out of data analysis in neuroscience could be used to design better AI or even BCI uh, decision making systems. So that's all about uh, computation uh, in neural ensembles. Now we go to the, the second study I'd like to talk to you about, which is uh, basically uh, the thing we heard about in, uh, uh, in, in one of the questions earlier, where do these memories live? And like El, uh, El said, and what happens in these neural ensembles compute, but uh, where, where are they maintained? And if we heard about short-term synaptic plasticity and the change of waves, I don't have time to go into this dynamic coding story that you see here, but basically the idea is that it's not persistent activity that maintains memory because of metabolic efficiency. It's really synaptic waste. Can we find this effective connectivity? That's what I want to wrap up with. We have a specially a special delayed response task. I hope I'm not running uh, over time that much. Uh, this is a classical task again from uh, Earth's lab that is used to build ocular motor BCIs. The monkey fixates, there's a queue at a certain uh, angle, and then there's a delay, and the monkey has to remember the location, the angle, and saccad back to it. Uh, we measured, uh, we had recordings from three brain areas, I'll focus on FEF or from the live fields here. We can look at pairwise correlations, and we're doing that to find, of course, the, the connectivity between different uh, uh, electrodes or, or even neural subpopulations. Here, I look uh, at a different way of doing that. First of all, the ensembles, what they do here is they maintain location. So they're like the spatial maps that Beth uh, talked about. And we know also from uh, Jonathan's talk this morning, uh, he talked about bias and the oblique effect. Basically, bias is zero, if you remember from his plots, 
along the cardinal directions, zero and pi, basically, and the kind of the degrees. This is exactly what we are using here. Uh, we are we know that the connect effective connectivity in ensembles maintaining uh, location along the cardinal axis or the horizontal axis uh, will be sparser because behavioral and neural responses suggest that remembering such locations is easier and this is exactly what Jonathan talked about this morning, the oblique effect. So the brain processes information along this axis more efficiently. So this is the, guy, the person who first observed this oblique effect as Mach, the Austrian physicist, you might recall uh, the Mach speed. And this is some plots that show what it is. We heard it already and I don't have time to go into more details. Uh, what we did is we used a biophysical uh, model called neural field that basically uh, uh, you can assume that you have a multi electrode array and it describes depolarization on a patch underlying these multi electrode arrays and the different colors you see on this video correspond to different levels of uh, depolarization. And the advantage is of course that we can link spatial and biophysical properties of neural ensembles to observe brain dynamics. So we trained this by physical model as an autoencoder, and you see here the, the cross function we used with the, uh, this is the autoencoder architecture. And these are the equations of uh, neural field models where you have two equations basically, one for post synaptic filtering, the other for the decaying or traveling wave front, the mu and v, v is the depolarization, mu is the wave front, s is the speed of the wave front, c is the dispersion of connections. Uh, the, the compass here are the time constants associated with new modulation, etc. Again, this is very quickly. You can skip that. The important thing is what do we get out? Training with neural data, we get out exactly the uh, uh, power spectra that correspond to different cell assemblies or neural ensembles for different locations. So theta here is the location on the visual screen, 0, 180, 300. On the vertical axis, we have spectral power. And of course, on the likes of our frequencies, and again, we see exactly what that showed, and I was very happy to hear, to hear this. Um, it's basically theta frequency dominating at the largest spatial scale because these are the first principal axis. And here we have the equations. We go from descriptions in the time and space domain to Fourier space. The other, the most important thing that I promised you is we get the effective connectivity of different FEF ensembles. Namely, here, uh, vertical axis is the sending subpopulation. Horizontal axis, the receiving subpopulation or electrodes on the multi electrode grid. And so each entry here is the connection weight, how much the signal propagating from one electrode, the sending or subpopulation, is amplified or attenuated when it reaches the receiving population. That's what we get. And we have six panels again, and different colors correspond to the strength of this weight. Interestingly, what we get is block structure. You see this translation invariance here, which is exactly what we have in convolutional neural networks that model uh, the visual cortex. So this pops out basically in CNNs. We impose that a priori by hand. Here, it came out of our data without imposing it a priori. So the area that produces the saccade, the visual response, has again some kind of similar structure as uh, we observe in visual areas. And we have also in CNNs. That's what we get. How to quantify differences uh, between these different ensembles and the effective connectivity between them. We appeal to graph theory, and this is used for function connectivity analysis, in particular path length. So you might have heard about path length. It's a very it's a popular notion. Uh, there is a, a very popular play written by, by this gentleman here, a maker playwright, John Guerre. Uh, the six degrees of separation, each one of us is connected to any other person. This is common acquaintances. Here we did the same thing. We have electrodes on the nodes of a graph, and then we count how far one electrode is from, an, from another based on this effective connectivity analysis. So this gives us the characteristic path length, and we have smaller path length, means we have fewer steps that are connect to different populations in the neural ensemble. We can quantify that with this equation here, and this is more metabolically efficient. So this um, neural ensemble, uh, it's 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 more uh, yeah it co consumes less energy, and first result is that this quantity from graph theory indeed partitions the space of locations, and we have similar values for horizontal and right visual hemifield and left visual hemifield in green, blue and red correspondingly. So we can if you tell me what the characteristic problem is, I can tell you what the stimulus that the ensemble represents is. Basically, and we did also decoding and confirmed these uh, results. 
And the last result that I'd like to mention is that the smallest path length, the sparsest connectivity is indeed for queues on horizontal meridian, which means that information has fewer steps, propagates faster, it's less energy consuming, the brain responds preferentially to horizontal queues, and this is exactly the oblique effect, and you can think of evolutionary reasons we know paint to really distinguish horizontal, uh, let's say, uh, objects on the horizon or along the vertical direction. So that's uh, a summary of uh, my talk. I try to talk about the structure and communication in neural ensembles, and maybe we can, uh, I'll stop sharing now and we can go to some questions. I think you're muted. Shall I do it? Yeah. I'm trying to unmute myself. Yeah, I don't no, think I, I can. can. You. No, but here you know I am muted. Oh, good. You. you you want me to bring on your screen uh, or two? Uh, no, no, that's fine. Um, so let's uh, look at the questions. Dimitri, you can bring up the questions. No need for me to go through them, right? Yeah, no, I think these are from a previous session. From what I oh, <laughs> yeah, I so haven't read them. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, let's see what we've got. Unless I'm uh, I'm missing something. If somebody asks something that I'm missing, please let uh, me. Yeah, usually. Yeah, you're right. This is from the previous uh, session. Uh, <laughs> um. So. Um. <laughs> you can ask me a question if you have one. I, 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 I know, I know you don't believe that much in this uh, assembly. Maybe it's uh, yeah, it's it's true. Uh, as you know, I I, uh, <laughs> I have these very eccentric views, right? Um, so uh, <laughs> um, uh, I'm very skeptical that information is stored in synapses. Um, uh, and uh, and so similarly skeptical about the neural networks, but the, um, I guess I, <laughs> it's, it's hard for me to formulate a question because this work of yours is so new to me. Um, it's, uh, certainly an interesting way to tackle the, um, the question of, uh, what the various areas, uh, are in fact computing, which is, uh, the uh, question that we're all um, wrestling with, um, but I'm unable to ask a, a, you know, a well-formed question, I'm afraid. So maybe we're, are we going to have a general discussion or are we gonna wind up now? Up to, up to you, we can... Uh... Well, can we, uh, can you renew? Ah, wait a second. Now we're starting to get some questions. Yeah, there is the round. Maybe we can bring him on uh, uh, the screen. Yeah. Um, here, yeah, Earl wants to ask a question. So bring yeah, him uh, on the screen. Okay. See, I don't need to do anything, do I? No, uh, it takes a bit of time, maybe. Let's L your uh, out. Ah, uh, okay. I need to. Here we uh, go. Yeah, great. So this question of how ensembles are are um, detected in the in the in vivo functioning brain, of course, crucial because we all know what an ensemble is, just have no way of looking at it. But you know, it strikes me that you have a good way of looking at or thinking about neural cores for consciousness, because what is consciousness but a unified experience of all these different networks all talking to one another on, all on the same page. Do you have any predictions or about how, uh, what it is about ensemble formation that would make a conscious thought versus an unconscious thought? Big question, I know, but maybe you've thought about this. Um, yeah, I mean, what we know from fMRI studies, I think, is that uh, basically uh, the connectivity changes, obviously, you, know, you have this segregation of different areas. When you move from uh, conscious to unconscious state, you have, you know, frontal parietal networks breaking down at the large fMRI level, let's say at the uh, macro scale yeah. level. Now, what will happen in cell assemblies, uh, I would expect, or in your ensembles, I would expect that there will be a measurable uh, Using the you know the approach I just presented, we could be able to measure significant differences 
for the same area, uh, you know, resting state versus conscious state versus unconscious state. And uh, I would expect a segregation, right? Of So neurons would have within the same area. Sure, I, get it, I was thinking more along the lines, let's, let's take the Haynes model of a global neuronal workspace. So obviously, he says that there's a little bit of activity here and there by ensemble. That's not enough. You need the whole cortex to all be together, like a applause, a whole crowd applauding together. So I'm just, do you, do you think there's that's the way to go? I mean, is there some sort of crucial threshold you cross where the ensemble gets big enough or inclusive enough for it to become a conscious thought, or is it, is it uh, like you know, separate ensembles all? Um, that unconsciousness, but somehow getting them all working together into one global ensemble, is, is that what it is? I'm asking a very vague, big question. Yeah, no, no, I mean, it's, it's you're, a very you're, good you're, 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 you're addressing big questions. I'm trying. Um, um, yeah, I, I, it seems to me that, you know, that there is, I think one would have to, to quantify this, it seems to me that one would have to work at both levels simultaneously. I'm thinking on the spot here. So we should be able to quantify uh, between area connectivity, with we'll measure scale uh, connectivity measures, and at the same time also look within a, what happens within a certain area and see if somehow you know what changes in the effective connectivity within the ensemble. And of course, one might expect that uh, maybe there is first of all this decrease in uh, connectivity wouldn't happen. Let me mute. Uh, sorry, Randy, I'm muting you because I'm getting feedback. Uh, yeah, so this decrease in connectivity wouldn't happen at the same time at both scales. Maybe it happens f uh, first within the frontal areas, for example, that, you know, like your work has shown, uh, mediate executive control. So we have a strong decrease there. And then because they don't broadcast signals from frontal areas to parietal areas that we're talking, then connectivity within uh, neural ensembles in parietal areas or chiptal areas goes down because they rely on intuitive feedback uh, from frontal areas. So the, I, I assume there should be some kind of temporal, uh, basically uh, some sequence with which we will observe these connectivity changes. Uh, so I think that's what we need to do actually, I would say, to have a, a unified approach for assessing macro scale and micro scale connectivity. I talked about micro here, but of course macro scale is easy. So, you know, our DCM work, for example, together does exactly that. Mm -hmm. or, or any other effective connectivity or functional connectivity method, brain or causality or anything. Yeah, yeah for the question. Uh, I also, I think Peter also has a, a question, so I'll try to bring Peter, thanks Earl, uh, to the screen. If I, um, okay. Sorry, Randy, I think I have muted you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, you should. Yeah, yeah, there was uh, a lot of interesting things. One thing that struck me was that there are a lot of models of categorization that assume that there's a collection of sensory evidence coming in, and then, uh, then the categorization process begins. The, the, what you presented is a very different view where those things are happening seemingly intermixed with each other and somehow integrated. Um, so, uh, and in different networks. Oh. <laughs> so, so how do you, how do you like, how do you put that together? How would you think about the bigger question about how the evidence is evaluated and then category, you know, and then the decisions made? Uh, okay, I'll mute. Randy again because it's a bit noisy. So yeah, to answer your question, and I'm getting feedback from you maybe. Um, so what we know is that the monkey is trained to perform the task, and the task is categorization. So the monkey has already learned these categories. So in a sense, it's it's about um, as performing as a cat to respond basically, it does not need to, um, so it needs to indeed to uh, compute perceptual uh, boundaries, but they're already there, it's not, he's not learning them. So uh, what I think uh, Earl's earlier work with Marcus has shown is that categorical and sensory information coexist in the network at the same time. There is color 
information and uh, and uh, motion information coexisting and uh, basically there is a gradual um, if one looks at both tasks at, uh, concurrently there is a gradual uh, let's say transformation of sensor information gradient uh, from uh, of sensor information in early areas to uh, categorical information in uh, in uh, higher areas basically so you can see an overall gradient what we are showing here is how this gradient is uh, let's say boils down um, in terms of the computations performed by specific brain areas. So at the uh, specific brain area uh, level, individual brain area level, depending on the task that the monkey has to perform. And we say that it's, it's not the same depending for both sensory domains. It depends on the sensory domain because precisely it's much easier for us to, if you do it, actually we run this experiment in EEG, with EEG in the lab here in London, with humans, and if I show you the cloud of random dots, it's much easier. You can tell me, like the subject can tell me, if it's uh, green or greenish or reddish, versus if I have to integrate information and compute, you know, motion direction uh, specifically. But in both cases, of course, I know I've learned the categories. Sorry, I, I will unmute you. See. Did I miss any question? So yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Peter. I'll get engaged if you're not. Okay. So I think we can uh, bring this to closure. I would like to thank everyone for staying with us so late here in Europe. I'll see you. We'll see you all tomorrow, at nine Eastern time, three Central European time. Till then, uh, have a nice uh, evening or rest of your days.